In this video, I'm going to be showing you what I think is the best way to get started painting, playing and collecting Warhammer 40,000. So if you're brand new to the hobby and have no idea what to do, or just wondering what Warhammer 40,000 is, by the end of this video you should have enough knowledge and a better understanding of what the Warhammer hobby involves. Welcome to Tabletop Ready, my name's Michael and in this video I'm going to be showing you what Warhammer 40,000 is all about and I'm going to give you the confidence and knowledge you need to get started painting, playing and collecting so you can go away and get started in this amazing hobby yourself. Warhammer 40,000 takes place four millennia in our own future. The vast and fragmented Imperium of mankind fights for its own survival against numerous alien races, dark gods and its own bureaucracy and corruption. Against all these horrors stands the armies of the Imperium, elite space marines, fanatical sisters of battle and untold hosts of soldiers and devoted servants, all who will give their life for the mighty god emperor of mankind who sits on the golden throne of Holy Terror. Warhammer has so many ways to engage and interact with it, there's no right or wrong way. Whether it's gathering a collection of miniatures to battle against your friends or other hobbyists, or you just enjoy the rich background and lore, it's your personal experience, no one else's. First of all, this Getting Started series is going to revolve around the Command Edition starter set, but everything that I'll talk about and show you can also be applied to the Elite Edition and also the Recruit Edition starter sets if those are what you have. As well as the starter set, I really recommend getting the Citadel Paints and Tools set as we'll be using everything in this set to get our miniatures built and painted. The other products you'll see me using throughout this tutorial are some different brushes and a texture spreader, a paint palette, plastic glue, Citadel undercoat sprays, I'll link everything in the description as well as showing you on the screen when I use them, so don't worry. I know there's a lot of different products in this video, but I just want to show you the possibilities and the variety of products that are used, so you can get the best out of however you decide to get started. And the products in this video have been carefully chosen to give you a great foundation of products to not only get your starter set built and painted, but to also carry on and build upon your collection of Space Marines and Necrons. And with that said, let's go away and take a look at what's in the starter set. In the box you get an 80 page command manual, a double sided gaming board which folds out for when you're ready to play, 10 six sided dice, two range rulers and a reference sheet for all the different units. You'll also find a bunch of sprues that hold all the terrain and miniatures. For the Space Marines you get a Primaris Captain, three Outriders and five Assault Intercessors. For the Necrons you get an Overlord, ten Necron Warriors, three Scorpec Destroyers with one Plasma Sight and three Canoptec Scarab Swarms. And something that makes this Command Edition so good is that it has a small sized 184 page rule book. There really isn't much else you need to be honest, except for the hobby supplies to build and paint them, which I recommend the Citadel Paints and Tools set. If this is your first time visiting Tabletop Ready, this is my channel where I make my own painting tutorials that are made for anyone wanting to start painting miniatures or even just looking to get better. I would love for you to go check out some of my other tutorials including how to get started with painting miniatures, getting them built and learning how to undercoat them for painting. All these tutorials are great companions for this video as I go into a lot more detail and the ideas involved that I may not go into in this tutorial. If you enjoy my content I would love for you to come and join me and subscribe to Tabletop Ready where I'm going to continue to make videos to help give you the confidence to paint your miniatures and enjoy your hobby. This tutorial is going to be a guide that takes you through the command manual to give you a better understanding of what is involved in building, painting and using your miniatures on the tabletop. This manual contains everything you need to know to get started and it gives you an overall explanation for what Warhammer 40,000 is. You'll learn all about collecting, painting and the different ways to play the game, the background and lore 
And not only that, but there's also tons of artwork and pictures of painted miniatures to get you inspired. So once you've gone through all of this, I'm sure you'll be eager to get started. Everything you need to get started playing Warhammer 40,000 is included in the Command Edition starter set. You have your battlefield where your miniatures will battle against each other, some dice to determine the success or failure of your unit's actions, and range rulers which can be used at any time to check distances to see if weapons or abilities are in range to do anything. The manual takes you through six missions which are designed to introduce you to the basics and fundamentals slowly. As you progress through each mission, you'll take command of your armies progressively as you learn how to play. So I'll be going over each mission and the units needed and how you can get them ready to use. I'll also be talking about what you can expect to learn from each mission. Just remember that everything does take time and practice. Just take your time and enjoy the journey. When it comes to getting your miniatures ready, you're going to want to know how to build them and get them painted. So let's take some time now to learn about what that involves. The very first thing you're going to do is to need a space or an area you feel comfortable. So you can enjoy your hobby time and it wants to be well lit so you can see what you're doing. And when you've found somewhere you want to keep it clean and tidy as it can get messy whilst you build and paint. So something I like to do is use the box insert and have it so one of the long sides of the box folds down. This creates a space you don't have to worry about getting messy and you can pack it all away easily when you're not hobbying. All the miniatures and terrain come on sprues which you'll have to remove them from. And for the first mission we're going to need to build the 5 intercessors so let's start with those. The tools you're going to need are the clippers and scraping tool you get in the tools and paint set. The manual shows you what parts you're going to remove and how they go together, so make sure to follow these instructions carefully. When removing parts from the sprue use your clippers, keeping the flat side facing the part you want to remove. I like to cut a little distance away to avoid damaging any parts. The excess sprue can then be removed with more care once it's separated from the frame. Start by getting all the parts you need to build the first intercessor. And when you have all the parts, you'll see where the connections have been removed, the area doesn't look very good, and you may have mould lines in places as well. We can clean up those areas and remove any mould lines with the scraping tool. This tool works exactly how you would expect, removing any excess plastic by scraping it away. Work slowly with a small amount of pressure as you don't want to remove more material than you need to. You could remove and clean up your parts as you need them, or you could choose to remove all the parts that you need first and then clean them all together at the same time. It's really up to you. The great thing about all these miniatures in the box is that they all push fit together, without needing any glue. But I want to give you the option if you do. The glue used to stick plastic parts together is known as poly cement or plastic glue. This type of glue is specifically designed to work with plastic by melting the contact surfaces creating a weld between the two parts once it has dried to create a very strong bond. Hobby tip! If you find it tough to push your parts together, you can use your scraping tool to make the peg holes a little bigger, but I would only do this if you are gluing your parts together though. Again the manual will show you how the parts fit together. So take your time building the five intercessors, including fitting them onto the bases provided. If you're unsure if the base is the correct size, you can match it to the image in your manual. When you have your miniatures built, you may want to get them painted. I want to shout out all my current supporters who helped make this tutorial possible. Mamut, AJ Savoy, Daryl King, Ryan Rose, Reva, Christopher Harby, Zach Zed, and Mirak. I would also like to say a massive thank you to I paid for the whole patron name, I'm going to use the whole patron name, G Matthews and Alex Smith, who have either recently become patrons or donated to the channel. It really does make a difference. If you want to support the channel as well, you can become a channel member or subscribe to my Patreon. 
You'll be kept up to date with what I'm up to behind the scenes and you'll also get access to all my videos early. Painting miniatures is a massive part of the Warhammer hobby and involves so much more than I'm able to go through in this video. But what I'm going to show you are some of the fundamentals and basics so you can get some basic colours on your miniatures ready to use them in a game. Don't worry though, because as well as showing you how to paint and the basic colours you'll need to get your box ready to use, I'll have standalone tutorials to help you get your miniatures and terrain fully painted and finished. As well I've got plenty of other tutorials on the channel to help you get started and whatever I think you'll need I'll put in a getting started with 40k playlist. The one thing I'm sure everyone will tell you to do before painting is to undercoat your miniatures. An undercoat just helps the paint adhere to the plastic better and prevent it from easily being rubbed off or removed. To undercoat your miniatures we can use these coloured sprays just make sure to follow the instructions on the tin and use them outside or in a well ventilated area. I really suggest watching my undercoated miniatures tutorial while going into detail about the whole process. To help make undercoating your miniatures easier, you can use some blue tack and stick them to a ruler or something similar. This lets us easily move and rotate the miniatures around so we can get to all those awkward areas with the spray. I've chosen to undercoat the Space Marines with Macrag Blue. The Necrons with Chaos Black and Wraith Bone for all the terrain. I've chosen these colours because they create a great starting point for how we're going to end up painting all our miniatures and terrain. And whilst you're waiting for the undercoat to dry, let's get ready to do some painting. You're going to need some brushes, a paint palette and some water. So the products I use in this tutorial I use because I want to be able to showcase some of the products that are available to you and what I like to use in my own hobby. But feel free to substitute anything I use for something you prefer. The Citadel paints are water based acrylics which means they can be used with water. They're also designed so painting our miniatures has never been easier with a variety of different types of paint to choose from. You have your base paints with a red label, these tend to have a stronger colour in them for better coverage when painting. Lay paints are what you would consider to be your standard kind of paint, great for layering, mixing and glazing. Shades are washes that can be applied to a miniature to easily create definition once it's dried. And technical paints give us the opportunity to apply different effects to our miniatures. Hobby tip, to make painting miniatures more comfortable, why not use some blue tack and stick them to some plastic shot glasses? This is also going to help prevent us from touching and handling the miniatures too much whilst painting them. The first thing we're going to do is paint over the Macrag Blue in the coat we sprayed with some Macrag Blue from the pot. The colours you get from the sprays aren't always a colour match for the paint you get from the pot. And whilst we're painting we may need to reapply the base colour or use it to clean up any messy areas or if we make mistakes. If we did have to do any of this whilst just having the sprayed colour, it would be pretty obvious where we painted from the pot. So let's do some painting. The brush I recommend using to paint our base colour, and what I'm using here is an STC base large. We're going to take some paint from the pot and thin it down with an equal amount of water on our palette. We want to thin the paint because it makes it easy to work with as you're going to find out. I also like to remove some of the paint on some paper towel first, because we don't want to use an overloaded brush. Keep your brush moving and try to avoid going over any areas you've already painted. This is going to help prevent any unwanted texture and brush marks created whilst the paint is still drying. And when you've completely covered your miniature, let that layer of paint fully dry before doing anything else. And because we thinned our paint, it doesn't cover very well. Here's what it would look like if we painted over a lighter colour. That's okay though because we can now paint another layer exactly the same way we painted the first layer. Painting with multiple thin layers lets us build up the colour without losing any details and gives us a nice smooth finish once we're done. So what I've just shown you is a very basic and fundamental technique but what I consider to be the most important if we want our miniatures to look as good as possible. And whenever I'm showing you how to paint something moving forward I will be using multiple thin layers, even though I may not show it. 
Now you know how to paint something, we can work on getting the rest of the base colours painted on our assault intercessors. I'll be using a variety of different brushes as we get everything painted, but I'll be sure to show you on the screen what brush I recommend along with the paint. Using Lead Belcher, let's paint some of the details on his weapons, backpack and helmet. Now use some Retributor Armour to paint the chest decoration, shoulder pad trims and the insignia on the arm and chainsword pommel. Hobby tip! Using metallic paints can leave little flecks in your paint water, so make sure to change it often. Next we're going to use a bad and black for all the weapon casings, belts and pouches and all the joints in the armour. If you see any of these purity seals, paint them with Corax White. Mephiston Red can then be used for the helmet lenses, buttons on the arms and the wax part of the purity seals. Mephiston Red is also used for the sergeant's helmet so we know which one he is. Whilst painting all these base colours, it is a good idea to be as neat as we can. But if you are like me, you're going to make mistakes and things are going to look a bit messy. You are allowed to neaten up though using the base colours, so don't worry. As well, when you're painting multiple miniatures at the same time, we can do something called batch painting. So rather than painting each individual intercessor until it's finished before we paint the next intercessor, we can paint each colour across all the miniatures at the same time. This speeds things up and helps with consistency. Just take your time when painting and always go at a pace you're comfortable with. And by the time you've finished painting the base colours on the intercessors, you should feel more confident about painting. For this tutorial, I'm only going to be showing you the basic colours to paint everything in the box, so you can get everything ready to use pretty quickly. You'll then be able to take your time in getting everything finished, and I'll have additional tutorials on the channel to help you do that. So now we've gone through some of the basics of building and painting, you should have a better idea and understanding of what I'm talking about. And we can now work our way through the missions and learn how to play some Warhammer. While scouting enemy territory, an assault intercessor squad is ambushed by Necron Warriors. Without hesitation, the Space Marines ready themselves to fight through the ambush and regroup with the rest of their brothers. This mission will show you how to move your models around the battlefield and open fire with ranged weapons. To play this mission, you will need 3 Assault Intercessors and 5 Necron Warriors with Gauss Flayers. So for each mission, it's going to tell you what troops to use, so we're going to have to get them ready. And we've already done the Assault Intercessors, so let's get some Necron Warriors painted. Our Necrons first need to be undercoated using some Chaos Black Undercoat Spray. This time though we're not going to paint black over the undercoat, instead we're going to learn how to dry brush. Before we get the main colour painted for the body, Necrons all have a lot of details, joints and gizmos under their main body sections, so I want to tackle this first so we don't have to worry about it once we've painted everything else. The best way and quickest way to paint these details is with a dry brush, and if you've never dry brushed before, all you need to do is load up your bristles with your paint and remove as much of the paint as you can on some kitchen paper. And when you dry brush in, you want to keep your brush moving pretty quickly against the details. What's happening is the paint is being deposited right on the edges and raised areas and not being allowed to get into any of the shallower details. Try not to overdo this step, build it up slowly. The idea is to highlight all the details and this is why we started with the Chaos Black Undercoat. Now you've done that, paint all the sections of the body using Rune Lord Brass. Lead Boucher can then be used to pick out details on the weapons. Paint the weapon casings and barrels with some Abaddon and Black. To finish the Necron Warriors, paint any eyes and the orbs and the gun barrels first of all with some Corax White. Corax White creates a great base for Tesseract Glow, which we need to make sure is well mixed before we use. So make sure it looks like this, and not this. Apply the Tesseract Glow in the sockets and over the orbs. We now have both our Assault Intercessors and Necron Warriors ready for battle. Using the diagram in the manual set up your miniatures on the battlefield. 
Assault Intercessors along one of the long edges and the Necron Warriors on the opposite edge. The Assault Intercessors have to fight through the Necron Warrior ambush by reaching the long battlefield edge the Necron Warriors were set up. The Space Marines win if two or more Intercessors successfully escape. The Necrons win if the Necron Warriors destroys all of the Assault Intercessors and it's considered a draw if only one Intercessor managed to escape. Because this is an ambush, the Necron Warriors will go first. First select one of your Necron Warriors and you can move that miniature in any direction up to their move characteristic, which is found on their datasheet. So for the Necron Warrior, this is 5 inches. Engagement range. Models cannot move through other models or move within 1 inch of enemy models. This is known as the engagement range. If you feel you want to cover more ground and move more than a miniature's move characteristic, you can instead perform an advance, instead of a normal move. To perform an advance, roll one six-sided dice, commonly known as a d6, and add the result to your movement characteristic. If you choose to do this, then that model can no longer shoot. You can choose to remain stationary rather than move. Simply leave the model where it is, it is not considered to have moved. Once you've finished moving a Necron Warrior, continue selecting the rest of the Necron Warriors, deciding how they'll move. And when you've moved or not moved your Necron Warriors, it's now time to fire their weapons. Each model can shoot once in this phase, unless you choose to advance them previously. A model can only shoot at a target that is within the range of its weapon. The range of a Necron Warrior's Gauss Flayer is 24 inches as shown on the datasheet. If the target is in range, then the Necron Warrior can make a number of attacks equal to the numerical value of the Gauss Weapons type characteristic. For the Gauss Blaster, its type is Rapid Fire 1, so the model can make one attack with it. If you look at the datasheet and see that a weapon has a type Rapid Fire, that weapon is capable of firing fewer aimed shots at a long range, or controlled bursts of fire at close range. Rapid fire weapons fire double the number of shots when the target is within half the weapon's range. For any advanced rules, feel free not to use them for your first playthrough, or just wait until you feel more comfortable with the basics. Roll 1d6 for each attack the weapon makes, and compare it to the fiery model's ballistic skill to see if they were successful in hitting the target or not. The Necron Warrior has a ballistic skill of 3 plus, meaning you need to roll a 3, 4, 5 or 6 to hit the target. A 1 or 2 misses. If the target has been hit, you'll need to roll another d6 to determine if that hit actually does anything and wounds the target. To see if the target is wounded or not, we need to compare the attacking weapon's strength to the target's toughness. A Gauss Flayer has a strength of 4, an Assault Intercessor has a toughness of 4. We can then compare these using the wound roll chart provided. Because both the strength and toughness are equal, you will need to roll a 4 plus on the d6 to wound your target. Don't worry if this is all seeming pretty complicated. Once you've played through the missions a few times, you'll start to know the rules off by heart. So just make sure to take your time and check the rules when you need to. So you've hit your target and it's successfully wounded. Now we can see if any armour the target has deflects the attack. This is called a saving throw. An Assault Intercessor has an impressive save of 3 plus because of his power armour. So now the person controlling the Intercessor gets to roll a d6 and if they roll a 3 or more they deflect the shot. Armour Penetration and Damage You may notice that the weapon profiles on your datasheet also have other characteristics such as AP armor penetration and damage. This will be detailed in later missions. If the saving throw was unsuccessful, the target loses a wound. If a model is reduced to zero, then it's considered destroyed and removed from play. You will find the wound characteristics on the datasheet as well. Once you've completed the sequence of shooting, continue to select the rest of your Necron Warriors until they've all shot if they're in range of a target. Now you've moved and shot with all your Necron Warriors, it's now time for the Assault Intercessors to retaliate and have their turn. 
The Space Marine player follows the same move and shooting sequences in the same order. Just be aware that you'll mainly be comparing the Soul Intercessor characteristics against the Necron Warriors. So an Assault Intercessor can move 6 inches instead of the 5 a Necron Warrior can move. Their ranged weapons have a range of 18 inches and also have a ballistic skill of 3 plus. A Necron Warrior doesn't have as impressive armour as a Space Marine so we'll need to make a saving throw of 4 plus and will be removed from play if that fails as they only have 1 wound. Once the Space Marine player has finished moving and shooting with all their Assault Intercessors it's time for the Necrons to activate again. Continue alternating between the Necrons and Space Marines until one of the victory conditions is met for this mission. So we've just gone through our first mission and learned how to move and shoot with our miniatures. But it's a good idea to make sure we're confident with these basic sequences before moving on. When the sound of battle can be heard in the distance, the Primaris Captain rushes to the aid of his brothers. He soon discovers a Canoptech Scarab Swarm lying between him and the Assault Intercessor squad. Without hesitation, he raises his sword and charges into the fray. This mission introduces hand-to-hand -hand fighting to your games and is designed to teach you how to charge and fight with your warriors. It also introduces units, which is how most models operate. To play this mission, you'll need the following models and their data sheets. The Primaris Captain, and Canoptech Scarab Swarm Unit which consists of three bases of Scarabs. So you'll have no problem getting your Scarab Swarms painted the same way we painted the Necron Warriors, but you'll probably need some help painting your Primaris Captain. Just like the Assault Intercessors, we start with the Macrag Blue undercoat and then our Macrag Blue out of the pot for our base colour. The Captain has a lot more detail on his miniature than the Assault Intercessors do and I'll be covering how to paint everything in a separate tutorial. But for now let's use some Corax White and paint the shield, the tabard, any purity seals, and any details like this decoration on his shoulder pad. We can also paint the bottom third of this shield he has on his chest. Let's now paint any silver details with lead belcher. This includes his power sword, the back of the shield, buckles and backpack. Next all the gold details like the chest decoration and this halo above his head. Hobby tip! You can go on to Games Workshop's website and see all the amazing images and turnarounds of all the miniatures in this starter box set. I like to use these as reference when I'm painting my own miniatures. To paint any belts, pouches and armour joints, I would use some Abaddon Black. And finally, Mephiston Red can be used to finish the purity seals and to paint the helmet lenses. Remember, we can always neaten up any mistakes or messy areas with some of that McCrag Blue from the pot. With everything you need ready, let's get set up to play the mission. In this mission we use using side B as shown in your manual. Place the Primaris Captain on marker D. Next place the Scarab base on marker C. And then the other two bases are placed within 2 inches of that base. The three bases of Scarab form a single unit for this mission. The mission lasts until one player has destroyed all the opponent's models. In games of Warhammer 40,000 each turn is split into different phases and each player will take it in turn to work their way through the turn sequence. Unless otherwise stated, each unit from a player's army can activate only once in each phase. When a player has worked their way through the turn sequence, their opponent takes their turn, repeating the process until the battle ends. Starting with the Necron player, work your way through the movement phase. You won't have a shooting phase sadly because the Scarabs don't have any ranged weapons, so we can move straight on to the charge phase. In the charge phase, your units can run across the battlefield and engage the enemy in close combat. Once the movement and shooting phase is done, if an enemy unit is within 12 inches of your unit, you can declare a charge. Again, if that unit advanced in the previous movement phase, that unit can't charge. When charging with a unit, 
roll 2d6 and add the two numbers together. This is the distance that a unit can charge. The first model we move must be able to move within the 1 inch engagement range of an enemy model to have successfully completed that charge. Otherwise the charge fails and no models are moved. As long as your first model has moved within engagement range of an enemy model, the rest of the unit can now move up to the distance rolled. If the models form a unit like the Scarabs, they must stay within that 2 inch unit coherency. Once you have enemy units within engagement range of each other, they are now considered to be in combat, and unlike the other phases, both players activate the units to try and destroy each other. So who fights first? All units that charge resolve their fights first to represent the momentum of their charge. Then players alternate choosing one unit to fight with, starting with a player who's not currently taking their turn until all the units are fought or are destroyed. When a unit is chosen to fight, the first get to pile in to represent the first momentum and close engagement you would imagine seeing. Each model can pile in 3 inches and must still keep their unit coherency once they've finished their piling move. When all your models are finished piling in, you can start the fight sequence which is very similar to how a model would shoot. You roll to hit, then wound, then a save and throw would be needed. The only difference being is what characteristics would be used, as a model could be better at fighting in close combat than they are at shooting at range. After piling in, models that are within engagement range of an enemy unit are able to make attacks. Models that are not within engagement range, but are within half an inch of a model who is, can also attack representing a second rank of warriors, getting stuck into combat and providing support for their unit. The number of attacks isn't determined by the weapon they use, but by the model's attack characteristic. So if we look at the datasheet for the Scarabs and Primaris Captain, each Scarab base has 4 attacks and the Primaris Captain has 5 attacks. Also we need to check what the weapon skill is of our models, which is used in place of the ballistic skill to determine what you need to roll to hit successfully when attacking in close combat. So the Scarabs will need a 4 plus to hit while the Primaris Captain needs a 2+, plus, representing his skill and experience in battle. When it comes to seeing if an attack has wounded a model, it works exactly the same as with shooting using the wound chart, the only difference being that we use the attacker's strength rather than the weapon's strength this time. So if we look at the data sheets again, the Scarab's strength is 3 and the toughness of the Primaris Captain is 4, so looking at the chart, we can see that the Scarabs would need a 5 plus to win the Primaris Captain. Something else we need to consider is what weapons our models are using. For example, our Primaris Captain has a Mastercrafted Power Sword, and you would expect a weapon that is Mastercrafted to give our Captain some kind of advantage, and it does. Melee weapons, like range weapons, also have characteristics. They have an AP modifier, and a damage profile just like a ranged weapon. But when it comes to strength, it's a modifier to the user's strength rather than its own. So the Primaris Captain's Master Crafted Power Sword gives him a plus one strength modifier, increasing it from four to five. And if we compare that strength five against the Scarab's toughness of three, the player controlling the Captain would need a three plus to wound. Saving throws are then made in the same way as if they had been shot from a ranged weapon. Each time an attack successfully wounds a unit, the controlling player chooses which model in their unit will make a saving throw, and it's that model that will then suffer the damage if it fails. If a model has already lost a wound, then the saving throw must be made for this model. Once you've finished a unit's fight sequence and made all of their attacks, they can now consolidate 3 inches towards the nearest enemy unit just like the piling. And again you must finish with an unit coherency. So now the Scarab Swarm to fought, it's now the Primaris Captain's turn to fight. Once you've finished a full turn, and assuming that both players still have models left on the battlefield, the other player now takes their turn in going through the turn phases as well until the victory condition is met. You should now know how to charge and fight with the units and have a better understanding of the turn sequence. 
Just remember to replay through some of the missions in the book if you need to, because I won't be going into so much detail about moving, shooting and fighting in close combat in future missions. A group of Scorpec destroyers has entered the fray with orders to eradicate the Space Marines completely. One assault intercessor squad has been ordered to hold out upon a defensible position, buying the Space Marines time to launch a devastating counter-attack. This mission introduces a new unit and terrain feature to your games. And to play this mission you'll need the following models and their data sheets. One Scorpec Destroyers unit consisting of three Scorpec Destroyers and one Intercessor squad consisting of four Intercessors and their Sergeant. Again the Scorpec Destroyers can be painted the same as described when painting the Necron Warriors. However they do have these huge blades that the Necron Warriors don't have. For these I would paint them first with Corex White and then apply Tesseract Glow over the Corex White like we have done with the eyes and orbs. I'll show you how to make them look more fancy in a separate tutorial. As well as the Assault Intercessors and the Scorpec Destroyers, you're going to need to build and paint some fuel pipes to use in this battle. I've started by undercoating the terrain piece with some Wraith Bone Spray as it's the closest colour to what we see on the box, making it so much easier for us to paint. With the terrain, just spend some time picking out details with Mephiston Red, Lead Belcher, Retributor Armour, Rune Lord Brass, and Abaddon Black. When it comes to cleaning up any messy areas, you can use some Corax White. I know it's not the same as the base colour, but it's what we have and you won't even notice once we fully paint it. And whilst you're painting the pipes, you'll come across this detail and this represents the Mechanicum who fabricates everything for the Imperium. So get all the other details painted first and when you're done, paint the left half of the cog design and the right side of the skull with Corax White. Now paint the opposite sides with the bad and black. You'll see a lot of this design around, especially if you collect any Imperial factions. Just have some fun with it. And again, you can look at some images and Games Workshop's website if you do need some help deciding on what to paint. But just know that they don't need to look identical to how Games Workshop have painted theirs. Now everything is ready to use in this mission, we can get set up. For this mission, we're again using Side B of the gaming board. Place a Scorpec Destroyers unit on Mark Array, again by placing one on the marker itself and all the other models from that unit within 2 inches of it. Then place the unit of Assault Intercessors on Marker E, again placing one model on the actual marker and then the rest of the unit within 2 inches of that model. When both units are set up on the markers, place a line of fuel pipes running across the battlefield diagonally between the Necrons and Space Marines. There's no right or wrong way to set up this terrain, just do what looks cool. The mission lasts until both players have had 4 turns each. If there are any Space Marines left on the battlefield, then the Space Marine player wins. Otherwise, if there are no Space Marines left, then the Necron player wins. Start the mission with the Necron player. Work your way through the movement, shooting, charge and combat phase as described in previous missions, alternating between both players until each player has completed four turns. As well as everything we've learnt so far, there are a few additional rules that you're going to need to get your head around to be able to play a game of Warhammer, so let's learn what they are. Some weapons are better than others at getting through armour, and this is represented by the AP, or armour penetration characteristic. When a player is making a saving throw for one of their models, they must modify the result on the dice using the AP characteristic of the weapon that made the attack. For example, this heavy bolt pistol has an AP of minus one. This means that whenever a target is successfully wounded with this weapon, they must apply the minus one modifier to that target's saving throw, making this three that was rolled for the Scorpec Destroyer a failed save, rather than a successful save if it hadn't been modified. This modifier can reduce the save to zero, meaning you would fail the save automatically. Some weapons are also capable of dealing more damage than others, which could mean a target is destroyed with one single attack. 
Generally, if a saving throw is failed, one wound is lost for each point of damage that weapon deals, which is shown by its damage characteristic. So if the damage is 2, then the target loses 2 wounds for each attack that successfully wounds the target. If a weapon does more damage than the target has wounds remaining, any excess damage is lost. It does not carry over to another model. You can split a model's attacks between individual targets though. It just means you have less chance of destroying an individual model. Something else we need to learn about are pistol type weapons that the assault intercessors carry. Usually you're not allowed to shoot at or with a model or unit that is within engagement range of an enemy. A model with a pistol type weapon however can, but it must target an enemy which is within engagement range of its own unit even if other friendly units are also engaged with the target unit. The fuel pipes aren't just there to make the battle look more interesting. These pipes are also considered an obstacle, which means they can impede a model's movement. If you want to move a model across an obstacle, you must account for the distance it takes to climb up and then back down again on top of the normal horizontal movement. So these pipes are one inch high, which means you need to account for an extra two inches of movement to move across the pipes, decreasing the distance you can move by those two inches. The pipes also count as inherently unstable, so you're not allowed to place a model or finish a model's move on top of the pipes. There is a lot that we are going through and there's still a few things left to explain, but it's always better to take your time going through the missions rather than rushing to getting them finished. You'll only end up forgetting everything. Once both players have completed four turns of play, decide who has won depending on the victory conditions given in the mission brief. Having regrouped, the Space Marines have called in reinforcements to aid them in the coming battles against the Necrons. An Outrider squad has been dispatched as an immediate response with orders to engage the foe. This mission introduces a new elite unit to the forces of the Space Marines, the Outrider Squad. In addition, this mission will cover the impact that casualties can have on the psyche of your warrior in the morale phase. To play this mission, you'll need the following models and their data sheets. One Outrider unit consisting of two Outriders and one Outrider Sergeant. One Necron Warrior unit consisting of 10 Necron Warriors equipped with Gauss Blasters and one Canoptech Scarab Swarm consisting of three Scarab bases. For the Outriders, you can paint the Space Marines the same way the Assault Intercessors were painted. To paint the bike they're on, paint any details you want to be silver with lead voucher. This includes the wheel centre and pipes, and anything else you think should be silver. The exhausts are painted with Retributor armour. A bad and black is then used for the tyres, weapon casings and consoles. Use Mephiston Red for the handlebars and weapon handles. And finally, if you have any Space Marines without helmets, paint the heads with Bugman's Glow. The ruins are painted in a similar fashion to the fuel pipes, so you should have no problem with getting them painted. Again, just have fun with it, and paint the details however you think they should be painted. For this mission, set up the gaming board using side B, and place the terrain on the board as shown in the mission briefing in your manual. Place the Outrider unit on Marker E, the Canoptech Scarab unit on Marker D, and the Necron Warriors on Marker C. The battle lasts until each player has had four turns. If there are still any Space Marine models left on the battlefield, the Space Marine player wins. Otherwise, if all the Space Marine models have been destroyed, the Necron player wins. This time, start with the player controlling the Space Marines, then work your way through the different faces to complete a turn, alternating between players until four turns have been played. The ruins are pieces of airy terrain, meaning they occupy a space on the battlefield defined by the area inside its walls. Any rules for the area terrain are applied to any models that are within its footprint. 
when an enemy unit is shooting at models within that footprint from outside of it. To represent the extra cover provided by the ruin, you can add a plus one modifier to the saving throw of those models. Ruins do not impede a model's movement either, unlike the fuel pipes, as any model is considered to be able to make their way through the rubble and damaged structure. The exception to this though are the Outriders, who would have a tough time on their massive bikes, so they'll just have to go around. Models that can move through the ruins are able to move to the upper levels as well. If you want to move a model to the upper level, you'll need to measure the vertical distance, just as you did for the fuel pipes. The difference being, you can end your move on the upper level. Terrain does play a big part in any game of Warhammer, so be sure to discuss what terrain is being used with your opponent. And you can find any rules and effects of different terrain in the Warhammer 40,000 rulebook. Something you'll have to do during a game of Warhammer 40,000 is test the courage of any unit that has suffered casualties during that turn. They do this by taking a morale test. So if 5 Necron Warriors were destroyed that turn, the Necron Warrior would have to roll a morale test for the remaining Necron Warriors in the unit. They roll 1d6 resulting in a 6. Add that number to the number of destroyed models giving you a total of 11. We then compare that number to the highest leadership in that unit which is 10. You pass a morale check if you roll less or match the leadership number. So in this case 11 is a higher number than the leadership, so the Necron Warriors are considered to have failed their morale test, and must remove an additional model from the unit chosen by the Necron player. If a unit has failed a morale test, it must now take a combat attrition test. After removing one model from the battlefield, roll 1d6 for each remaining model left in that unit. For each roll of a 1, remove an additional model of your choice from that unit. If more than half the unit has been destroyed over the course of the battle, remove an additional model on a roll of a 1 or 2. You should now understand the impact losing models can have on a unit's morale. So once you've played through 4 turns for each player, decide who has won depending on the victory conditions for this mission. The Primaris Captain has regrouped and marshalled his troops. With the Outrider squad engaging targets on the move, and a Brave Assault Intercessor squad holding the Scorpec Destroyer's advance, he selects his best men to charge into the heart of the Necron force, and the cunning enemy commander is finally revealed. To play this mission, you'll need the following models and their data sheets. One Primaris Captain, one Assault Intercessor unit consisting of four Intercessors, and one Intercessor Sergeant, one Necron Overlord, one Necron Warriors unit consisting of 10 Necron Warriors with Gauss Flayers. One Canoptech Scarab Swarm consisting of 3 bases of Scarabs. So there's only a few more things left to build and paint, so let's get unfinished. Let's start with the Thermo Exchange Shrine, which you should now be able to paint confidently. Again, use some reference if you want to. I'll be showing you how to finish all the terrain in another tutorial to this one, so make sure to check that out if you want to finish getting it all painted and looking nice for your games of Warhammer 40,000. You should also be able to get the plasma site painted. But just like the Primaris Captain, the Necron Overlord has a lot more detail to him. So let's go through the steps to getting him ready for this mission. Just like all the other Necrons, we're starting with the Chaos Black Undercoat which we then want to dry brush using lead voucher. Paint the body sections using Rune Lord Brass. Lead voucher for other details on his staff and any pipes. Now paint any decorative details like his headdress, glyphs on his chest, and these things hanging down in front of him using Retributor Armour. Some areas on his staff and around his body want to be painted with a bad and black next. Any orbs, eyes and the blade are painted the same as the other Necrons starting with Corex White and then Tesseract Glow. With the Necron Lord done, you now have everything painted to a battlefield standard. If you want to, you can do what I did and paint all the bases with the bad and black to finish them off. 
For this mission, set up the gaming board using side A and place the terrain as shown in the mission briefing. Instead of markers, each player will have a deployment zone. This is the area which you set up your units before the start of the battle. Players take it in turns to place a single unit in their deployment zone starting with the Necron player. It's up to you as the commander to decide where in the deployment zone that unit is placed for battle. The battle will last until either the Primaris captain or the Necron overlord has been destroyed. The player whose character is still alive at the end of the battle wins. In this mission a new type of terrain is introduced, the Thermo Exchange Shrine. This counts as an obstacle like the fuel pipes, which means no model can be placed on top of it. It can also provide some much needed cover. When being targeted by a shooting attack, if all the models in that unit are at least partially hidden from the enemy unit that are shooting, then apply a minus one modifier to that attacking unit's hit roll. So these Necron Warriors who have a ballistic skill of 3 plus would now have to roll 4 or more to successfully hit because of the minus one modifier shooting at the assault intercessors who are obscured by the Thermo Exchange Shrine. In games of Warhammer 40,000 it's cool to see infantry and vehicles battling it out but let's not forget about the heroic characters who lead their forces into battle and characters in Warhammer 40,000 have their own rules and abilities to lead their troops to victory. Characters have access to powerful artefacts and abilities to better protect themselves, whether that is more durable armour or some form of ancient technology that generates an energy field around them. These artefacts and abilities come into play granting the character an invulnerable save. The Necron Overlord has a phase shifter for example, which grants him a 4 plus invulnerable save. When making a save and throw, an invulnerable save is never modified by a weapon's armour penetration characteristic. It's difficult for these characters to be targeted during the midst and turmoil of a battle. Whilst the character is within 3 inches of any friendly units that have 3 or more models, characters can only be targeted if they are both visible to the firing model and are the closest enemy unit to the firing model. So if your characters are not within 3 inches of a friendly unit with at least 3 models in it, they can be targeted normally, so make sure to keep a bodyguard between your characters and the enemy's guns. Using all the additional rules and abilities in this mission means you should now have a good understanding of how Warhammer 40,000 is played, and you're now ready to play the final confrontation mission, where you'll bring together all your forces and knowledge to the battlefield. Critical blows have been dealt to both sides in the conflict so far. The time for strategizing, however, has come to an end. Your leaders must galvanize your warriors for the final confrontation. For this mission, you'll need the following models and their data sheets. One Primaris Captain, one Assault Intercessor Unit, one Outrider Unit, one Necron Overlord, one Necron Warriors Unit, one Canoptex Scarab Swarm Unit, one Scorpec Destroyers unit and one Plasma Site. For this mission you'll need to set up the gaming board using Side A. Place the terrain using the mission brief. Again each player will have a deployment zone of 5 inches measured from the board edge where they can set up their forces before the start of the battle. Players take it in turns to place a single unit within their own deployment zone starting with the Space Marine player until all units have been placed on the board. This battle is to the death and lasts until one player has destroyed all their opponent's models. The first to do this wins and should read about what this means for their defeated enemy in the mission debrief. Before the battle starts each player rolls 1d6, re-rolling ties. The player who wins will decide who will go first. Whoever goes first, players take their turns as described in previous missions. Once you have finished playing through this mission, you will have played your first battle of Warhammer 40,000, commanding a large army of warriors. All previous battles have led to this fight and only one side has walked away victorious. Now we've finished playing through all the missions, you're now ready to start your journey in Warhammer 40,000, where you can continue to collect and expand your forces to play more games and create stories, battles and narratives of your own.
So through this tutorial, we've gone through getting all your forces and terrain ready for battle and learned how to play a game of Warhammer 40,000 through the various missions. So watching this, I hope I've been able to give you the confidence and knowledge to go and start your journey in this amazing hobby. Just remember it's only a game. Make sure to become a great hobbyist who encourages fun and all the good things about the hobby. The experience you create with other people is far more rewarding and important than winning or getting the rules right. I really love this hobby and I love making these videos and tutorials to help others get started and enjoy their hobby. If you enjoyed this guide to Warhammer 40,000 then please give this video a like and let me know in the comments below, it really helps grow the channel. You can also support Tabletop Ready by becoming a channel member or a patron which I'll link in the description. Any support helps me produce more amazing content for you and you'll be able to keep up with what I'm up to and you'll also get to see all the videos early. Thank you so much for watching, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on future content and I'll see you in the next video.